Jimmy K here, Metal Voice. Look at this. The Metal Voice shirts are now on sale. Just go to the video description to find out on how you can purchase one. Metal! Welcome to the Metal Voice. Today on the show, Kelly Garney, entrepreneur, photographer, of course, co-founder of the band Quiet Riot, uh, and of course, a good friend of uh, Randy Rhodes, who owns Ghost Town Art and Coffee Shop in Nevada. What's a, what's your uh, city called or your town called there, Kelly? It's called Pioche, P-I-O-C-H-E. Yeah. It's Pioche, Nevada. Okay. And we're 175 miles north of um, Las Vegas, 100 miles from the Utah border. Yep. And um, it's a ghost town. Very it was cool. an old mining town established in 1865. Mm -hmm. And um, I came up here. Uh, I used to visit here with, with an uh, ex-girlfriend I had. And... Um, I do this uh, particular type of art uh, where I get my materials from old mines and old ghost towns, and um, and then as as I describe it, I draw with them. And uh, this was a great place to come to because, um, well, it's a very interesting town, irrespective of everything else offer. But um, as far as art supplies, I mean, it was a great source. So her and I used to come up here quite a bit. And we were up here and we saw a little house for sale. And it was priced very well. So we bought it as a vacation home. And eventually we didn't want to leave here anymore because we, we got tired of the city, the violence, the, just, just, just the shit that's in a city. And lived in big cities all my life and never really knew too much about small town life. And uh, it just really grabbed me. And I said, man, I just I just love this way of life. I love the people. Um, the main industry here is we have three bars in town. Uh, we don't have anything else. We have two gas stations. We have... Um, two restaurants one of which is mine and uh <laughs> okay. and and we have a county museum that's really badass but other than that we really don't have anything we don't have a market or anything and um it's really really hard work to live in a in a very rural place it's very lonely it's very isolated and um me and my girlfriend that I moved up here with, uh, broke up some time ago, about a year and almost two years. And, um, I've been on my own ever since running this whole circus shebang, whatever you want to call it. Go ahead. Tell me what you're up to today. Go. Well, okay. I just got an offer the other day to, to do a recording with Katie Siegel. I think I told you about that earlier. And that, that's just recording, but, but that's not what I really want to do. Um, I discovered this band called The Who. Do you know who they are? The Who? Yeah. Of course. Not 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 Roger Daltrey, not John and Twistle, Pete Townsend. They're different different Who. There's a band out there called The Who, and it's spelled H U. And they're a Mongolian band and they do uh, traditional uh, Mongolian music with little with a little bit of a metal edge. And they do a very, very interesting thing called throat singing, which I've been familiar with for years and years, because when I was telling you about how I don't really listen to music, I I listen to international music. I listen to music from all over the world. Yeah. Um, I'm a huge fan of cello music. That's my favorite music. Uh, I love all the Swedish, Norwegian, all that whole region, the stuff that they're coming up with. But then in the Asian countries, they have some very, very interesting music, too. And I discovered this band called The Who. H-U, The Who Band. Okay. You have to look them up, and you have to listen to this stuff. All right. Okay? It's, it's absolutely fascinating. 
And so what I've been trying to do is I've been trying to get um, somehow to get to Mongolia because I want to collaborate on a song with these guys because I don't, I, I, yes, I'm a bass player, but I play weird basses. I play eight strings, which no, hardly anybody does. I play, uh, I have a bass with a whammy bar on it uh, that works incredibly well. I can sound like a guitar player. I can sound like a fretless bass player. Uh, it's an extremely versatile instrument. I use a lot of effects. And I really want to go over to Mongolia, and I want to collaborate with the Who. Okay. And and I've contacted the Mongolian embassy to try to get this as a cultural exchange thing. I've contacted their management. And so far, I've pretty much been getting blown off. So if I put it out there in an interview, maybe they'll pay attention to me. Maybe. Maybe. You never know. And that's all I ask of you. Okay, and I'll, I'll we'll put that and I out. Want, I want you to go, at, you know, after you have your dinner that your wife is sitting there stomping her foot to, um, <laughs> um, go online and look up the, the Who band. There's a song called Wolf Totem. Uh, I want to do Wolf Totem Part 2. And when you see how badass this shit is, you're going to go, whoa. I just referred a guy to it uh, yesterday that approached me uh, about this Katie Sagal thing. And I said, well, and we were talking on the phone, and I said, well, this is what I, I really want to do. You know, I, I, I said, if I'm going to be a musician, I'm going to do it a lot different. I'm not going to go out and play in a cover band and, you know, and do a rap song or something, you know, in a bar for five people. Um, you know, I want to do something bigger as an artist, a musician, and, you know, as a creator. Um, I, I want to, you know, expand my horizons, you know, artistically. And, and I see this Who Band as a great way to do that. So please, please, please do me a favor. Just go look at it. I will. And I guarantee you, you'll do the same thing this guy did. And he wrote me back an email, and he said, oh, my God, the Who Band is badass. Let's go back in time. Um, and I want to talk about your book, Angels with Dirty Faces, if that's okay. Um, yeah. And actually, I, didn't, I, got, I ordered it, but I didn't actually get it yet. So I'm waiting for my copy. And in, copy, and in the meantime, you know, I, I'd love to talk about sort of your early years, the Quiet Riot years, and, you know, everything you've done in between. Right? Tell me about... I know you've had some sort of, you know, issues later on in life, but tell me about your upbringing, your life, you know, your parents and, and how you got involved with music. Well, I had, I had unbelievably fantastic parents who um, had, had two boys, me and my brother, and, and we were, we couldn't have been more different um, in any kind of imagination. Um, you know, my brother was very athletic, which, which is what my dad liked. Uh, my, my dad was a, a big athlete in college and the military and everything. He was a boxer, <clears throat> went on to become, after he got out of the army, he worked in bars as a bouncer. He was a badass, you know? And, um, my brother was, even though he was two years stronger than me, he was, you know, stronger than me and more athletic and and uh, more what my dad liked. But my mom, who who is an extremely sensitive person and and one of the most beautiful people you could ever meet, between the two of them, they recognized that I was a little bit different and. Um, I I didn't do well in school. I didn't like to participate in the things that they did in school. Uh, I was very much a loner. The only thing I found good about school was that there were girls there. <laughs> and and that was all I cared about was the girls. That was the only reason I showed up to school cuz I love I love women. I just adore women. And later on in my life that became um uh, something that was very important. Um, 
as far as what I did in life. But my parents, um, you know, they, they, they tried to make me, you know, into sort of a normal kid, (laughs) but it just, it just, it just wasn't happening. And it really, really, really got fucked up when I met Randy Rhodes and, you know, I I don't think I need to go into how we no. figured out, you know, oh, I'll be a bass player, he'll be a guitar player. He already was a guitar player. Long story short, he made me into a bass player. And um, and, and together, you know, we, we developed this dream of becoming rock stars. We got Barry and Alice Cooper and and all this stuff. And we're like 12 years old doing this. And, um, it, it just, um, morphed into this whole different version of, of probably what my parents envisioned, uh, their kid becoming. And so, uh, much to their credit, they embraced who I was becoming and they let me be a, uh, an individual which I think is an important thing for parents to do. Did, did is, you get, let me ask you this. Did, did, did you stray away from what your parents wanted to do because of uh, alcohol or drugs or anything like that? Um, well, while that did happen somewhat prematurely for, well, I don't know. You got to look at LA standards. You know, I mean, every 12 and 13 in L.A. where I was growing up in that time, you know, they're doing all kinds of shit. But, um, but yeah, all of a sudden, I, I wasn't just some teenage kid. I was some other kind of a monster. And, um, and my parents, you know, they were, they were really cool about it. You know, they, uh, you know, like I stole all my dad's beard and, tapped into his little bar he had in his house and me and my friends did you know we just had this vision of where we wanted to be and we were exposed at a very young age to a lot of stuff that most kids weren't exposed to and we were hanging out at rodney bingenheimer's club in hollywood a very famous club and uh certainly a very famous club for having um younger people attend it uh many 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 stories out there of of big bands Led zeppelin the sweet uh tommy bolin with t-rex uh bowie uh the the whole glam scene you know uh rodney's was the, the go-to club and, you know, there's all these hot little 13-year-old girls who look like, you know, they were like 21, you know, because of the way they dressed and the way they had grown up. They, you know, weren't, they really weren't kids anymore. And that's kind of what happened to me and Randy. Um, we, we quick became adults. And we realized that if we wanted to follow this dream of ours, basically how we had to be and think. And and so we went along, and and most definitely it was a, a, a particular lifestyle. Um, but we uh, we fell right into it, you know. Um, we, we, one of the earliest connotations of a band that we had, um, uh, involved, you know, a singer who was gay, you know, so we had to be very acceptance of, of, of gay things, you know, which was something, you know, growing up and, in, in picture perfect, you know, all white Burbank, um, back in those days. Um, was a little bit off. It, it wasn't the norm. We didn't have, like, gay kids in our school. It, I mean, if there was a gay kid in our school, we sure didn't know about it. 
But we didn't even go there very much anyway. So, uh, but when we did go there, we probably would have noticed one. But we didn't think it was weird. We we didn't find anything wrong with it. We just, you know, we're in this L.A. mode, Hollywood mode, uh, where you know pretty much everything was acceptable, and and we really liked that. You know, we we didn't like. Um, Hate, adversity, uh, differences, um, you know, people not getting along, people hating, um, people judging. Uh, Hollywood back in those times was um, a very free place, and and we fell right into that, and and we're very comfortable because we we were very very different, and. Um, and going back to my parents, they they were so accepting of that, and and just kind of let it let me go, you know. I mean, I didn't have curfews. I didn't, you know. I mean, when I mean there were a few times we got thrown in jail for some shit, you know, what whatever trouble we got into. Was that you and Randy you know? or and other they, friends? No, me and Randy. Okay. Um. Uh, you know, if somebody came to me and said, how many times were you and Randy in jail together? I'd say, I have no idea. <laughs> and I know. Are you talking about like petty crimes, like just grabbing a chocolate bar or little things like that? No. No, I'm not stealing a car now. <laughs> you are you can, stealing a car? You can Randy? some you chick to buy you a chocolate bar. I don't know. Um, some kids. No, no. I mean, I mean, just, just. What's an example? Stuff. Be, being out too late, being in the wrong place, being drunk, um, in, in an underage, wrong, in, underage the wrong bar. time. Right. I could go into a ton of specifics. I, I do write about a few specifics in my sure. book. Okay. I had this. There's this audio interview with Randy, and this is back probably when you were young with Randy. He said he didn't have a record player, and he learned all his licks from teaching. Is there any truth to that? Uh, quite a bit. Um, not entirely true, but quite a bit. Uh, there did come a time when Mrs. Rhodes purchased a very small record player for the house. Prior to that, we would listen to the radio, and we we lived up in the hills in Burbank, and you didn't get really good radio reception up there. And uh, really the only radio station that uh, played anything that was uh, of interest to us was KNAC, which is a very, very, very famous um, mm -hmm. L.A. rock station uh, back in those days. And um, so, uh, you know, probably a lot of people, unless unless they're pretty old, who are listening or, or reading your interviews, um, wouldn't understand, you know, listening to a radio and it fades in and out and in and out and you're like adjusting the dial and you, know, you have to actually be a, a pretty old fart to, to understand, you know, um, getting something like that. But we learned a lot off the radio and we learned a lot off a of record. We, um, we wouldn't necessarily buy a lot of records because we didn't have any money. But there was a guy down the street who was uh, probably your classic audiophile. He had a great stereo. He bought a lot of records, and he had a lot of weed. And we used to go down there and listen to records and stuff, and, and he was always buying new things of, of different things. Um, he wasn't mainstream at all, which which was actually very, very, very much uh, a huge benefit to me and Randy because we got exposed to a lot of bands that most people didn't hear, that the radio stations didn't even play. I mean, we're, we're listening to like the Scorpions and stuff like that way before anybody heard of them. You know, and, and bootleg, lots of bootlegs, 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 bootlegs. Those were the big thing. 
you know, and then you'd hear this song done live and and maybe there were different licks in it and things like that and 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 I mean everything that we we heard we were just complete sponges and we took everything we heard and saw and listened to and learned from it we we had like photographic memories when it came to listening to music we'd hear a lick and we'd go okay I'm remembering that and and then we we do our own take on it, or we do the same lick, you know. Uh, but uh, we really really had a, a a very unique upbringing in that the way we were exposed to things was was really weird. And then hanging out in Hollywood and seeing bands there, and listening to music in the clubs. Hollywood was a different environment back then. I mean, you could be a 12-year-old kid and walk up to the bar and get a drink. It, it just isn't like it is now. That's what it was like and, in Montreal, um, by the way. That's what it was like growing up in Montreal, Canada. It's basically That's um, good to hear. That somewhere else was like that. No, no. <laughs> and actually, it's probably still like that here. So in Europe, too, uh, you know, it's not much different. Um, right, yeah. It, it's like that in Europe. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so, what about and a lot Kelly, of great music. What, what about the older brother, Kelly Rhodes, you know, exposing Randy to Alice Cooper? Because usually the older brother, and like my older cousins, had records or music or brought me to shows. How did Kelly influence, you know, you and, you know, his little brother, right? There, there's always that yeah. trade off, like that sort of like pass me down to the younger kids. Well, that's, that's a really great question because I have to say that, that Randy's brother influenced us and, Lots of ways, not just so much music, but he was older than us, and he was a lot like us. He didn't hang out at Rodney, though, and he didn't really go to the kind of clubs that we were. He wasn't quite as enamored with, with Hollywood as we were, um, but um, and didn't, did, certainly didn't grow up in Hollywood from a, a, a fairly young kid. Um it just wasn't happening when when he was our age. He he's uh, uh, a few years older than us, and he was already past it. So, you know, he was wearing all these cool clothes, and we said, "Well, we like the way he dresses," so we kind of emulated him in that regard. And then, um, musically, he had some guys that he was playing with. Everybody was always older than us. Nobody was our age. Nobody. And except for, like, if we went to Hollywood and hung out in Rodney's or the Starwood or whatever, you know, then the kids were our age. But when it came to Burbank and growing up there, everybody was always older. And and as I say in my book... Uh, Burbank had this extremely fertile uh, growing ground for uh, talent of any kind, really. But if you were a musician, it, it was amazing because there were so many older guys around that played music, and me and Randy could learn from them. And his brother Kelly was great because he had access to a lot of these guys. He played with these guys. Um, me and Randy used to go out and, um, just be roadies for, for, uh, Randy's brother, Kelly, uh, just, just to be around the music and just to be at the party. Cause that's what you played back, back in those days. The, the clubs were mostly playing, you know, name bands and they didn't really play nobodies. And that's who we were. We were nobodies. Um, so the, you know, what became known as the Backyard Kickers, that was the thing. Just like and, Van Halen, right? And, Van Halen did the same thing. They were playing the back, the, the, exactly. the backyard parties. And, and it's the weather, yeah. too. It's the because, weather, because in Montreal, Canada, where it snows six months of the year, you know, in California, it's sunny, right? And you can play the backyards all year round. Yeah. And, and so we watched his brother doing this, and we said, well, we can do this, too. 
and um, and we really wanted to do it. We didn't want to be roadies anymore. <laughs> and, um, so we, you know, we we strived uh, to become better players. Uh, again, in my book, I I describe very much the process we went through uh, to become really good players to the point where. When we were 13 and 14, you know, I mean, the only people we're jamming with were 10 years older than us. And um, and so, you know, we, we came into our own in that regard, and we're able to put together some little bands here and there. Hey, this is David Ellison here. Frank Bellow. We are from, obviously, Megadeth and Anthrax, also Altitudes and Attitude, and we want to introduce our new coffee from Ellison Coffee Company, our signature roast, Altitudes and Attitude, a fine Indonesian light espresso roast. Pick it up, ellisoncoffeeco.com. Very well said. Oh, wait a second, we forgot something. A proud sponsor of the Metal Voice. <laughs> exactly what he said. Were you in Violent Fox? Kelly said he had a band with Randy called Violent Fox. Were you in that band? Interestingly, I was not in Violent Fox. Okay. And the reason being is because, and, and I really have to think hard on this at this moment where I'm exhausted from snow and cooking and everything else, but <laughs> okay. um, dur during me and Randy's friendship, we had a little spat, and we didn't talk for for quite a few months and um, um, I hung out with these other people and he was doing his own thing and, and we were just basically kind of enemies for a little bit and uh, just didn't talk and that's when Violet Fox was formed. Violet Fox had um, comp was comprised of uh, Kelly Rhodes on drums, Randy on guitar, and then there was another guy who was named Guy, who had been in at least one band with me and Randy, and uh, was not anything like us, but he, he could sing, and and he could play rhythm guitar, he couldn't play lead, and, and he had a garage that his parents didn't mind that we made a lot of noise in, so that made him you know, one of our best friends automatically. Um, but that's all Violet Fox was. It was it was three people with no bass player. Enter Drew Forsyth and Kevin Dubrow. All right, so where did you meet Drew? Drew, Drew had been in a band with uh, me and Randy and this this guy, Guy Pianessa was his full name. Um, and Drew was the drummer, and it was called Mildred Pierce. And and we're talking bands here that lasted like three and four months, yeah, no, if no, even I, that. I remember I grew up in that time too. I'm fifty years old, so there are garage bands popping up everywhere. I get it. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's what we were. We were we were classic garage bands and and these things don't last a real long time and you go out, you play at a few parties, you know. And um so it, it wasn't none of that was, was very serious stuff you know i mean all those little bands were really great <clears throat> and uh very short-lived played a few parties broke up got different people always a revolving door on them but always the core was me and randy trying to put together what we thought um was a dream um of what we really wanted. And, you know, so Drew Forsyth was somebody, you know, that we had played with. Uh, when it did come time to form a riot and we were looking for a drummer, we had Kevin Dubrow, why, who neither of us wanted. Uh, but he was such a forceful person and such a driven person that, we just said, oh, fuck, you know, why the hell not? Let's just go with this guy. At least he's into it as much as we are. And that was literally our attitude. He was he was not anything like what we were looking for. Randy and me, we had a dream of having, you know, a guy that looked like Alice Cooper or David Bowie, somebody fucked up. I mean, we had a band. 
called the Cats and Jammer Kids with a guy that wore dresses on stage. We almost got killed for doing that um, because we played at a high school and it didn't go over so well. (laughs) And and, and that's in my book, too, in great detail. Angel Uh, with Dirty Faces. We'll plug it again. Angels with Dirty Faces. Yeah, it really, you know, the book is really a great story because it's it's a story of two kids who wanted who had this dream and wanted to grow up and become rock stars. And you know, there's lots of kids out there who who want to do that and and you know, lots of parents these days, you know, who push their kids in that direction. And I see lots of kids online, you know, and they're like better than we were at that age and I'm like, wow, you know. Too bad we didn't know that fucking kid when we were young, you know. We (laughs) could have really done something, you know. But we were making it up as we went along, and and a certain point came along where Randy wasn't taking lessons, and we were making all this up on our own. Now, the big game changer, and I have to go back a little bit in time here, was, uh, and again, um, responding to your question about Kelly Rhodes, Mm-hmm. He introduced us to a band called Quiet Riot, or not Quiet Riot. <laughs> yeah, Alice right. Cooper. <laughs> uh, Alice Cooper. Um, and and we looked at this album cover. I mean, first thing we said, what, they have a girl singer? And he's like, no, 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 it's a guy. And he calls himself Alice. And we went, what? <laughs> you know, because nobody did that back then. And and so we found that pretty interesting. And we looked at the album cover and we were like, wow, we really like the way these guys look. Because we were already into looking weird and different and and, and not being normal. Um, being normal was, was really something that, that we avoided. And, and so now here comes this Alice Cooper thing. And that's like so far past normal back in those days. Um, that we were very attracted to it. And he said, well, Alice Cooper is coming here to be in concert. Do you guys want to go? And we said, well, yeah, fuck yeah. And we had never really been to a concert. Um, We saw one little show in Burbank with Blue Cheer. And at the moment, I'm sorry, that's the only band I can remember. All right. Um, but they were some, some pretty old school 60 burnouts by the time we saw them. Um, and you know, and it was cool to see a bunch of guys on, on a real stage. That was the first time we saw guys on a stage, you know? Um, and we thought, well, that sure looks better than setting up by the pool, (laughs) you know? And cause that's kind of what we were used to. And so seeing a bunch of guys on stage, you know, with a bunch of big amps and everything, we were like, well, that's where we need to go. We need, we need to be like those guys and we have to strive to be like that. And and how in the fuck are we going to do it? You know? And, and, you know, very luckily my parents and his mom, uh, were very cool about helping us increase our, our amps. You know, I mean, you'd buy an amp, and then, like, you'd go to your mom and say, well, this amp isn't loud enough. I need a louder yeah, yeah. one. Yeah, another one. <laughs> you know, and, and, and our parents were so cool. And and they would, you know, they were all working people who didn't have a lot of money. But they, they actually um, saved and, and worked harder, maybe, to to make it happen for their kids. Get the gist of you being exposed to Alice Cooper and that kind of uh, stage. That's cool. You know, I get it. I get it. If you read my book, it, it's explained exactly very exactly. well, very concisely and, and very, very well. I'm told um, that really gets the point across, but, but sure. Go ahead and ask me about Kevin. Well, what about Kevin? Okay. So, you know, he forces his way into the band. He's no Alice Cooper, but he's got his own little character going, right? Well, we didn't even see that. No, we okay. just thought he was a complete loser. Really? So, and, okay. Um, so, did Randy like him? If you didn't like him, did... no, we didn't like him at all. Did Drew like him? 
Um, eventually he did. Okay. But, um, um, you know, when, it, when, when we first met Kevin, it just, um, we were more like, well, this isn't the guy we were looking for. And, and you have to remember me and Randy had, had looked at and talked to and played with, you know, a lot of singers. And, and, you know, sometimes we do one or two things with them and it would be over. And sometimes we just have a rehearsal or a jam with them and it would be over. You know, we were pretty aggressive and, and pretty active. And and we're busy. I mean, literally busy. Uh, you know, looking, talking, trying, and and working to find the right guy. And you know, and then we met Kevin. And the first, the, the second we laid eyes on him, we said, you know, let's go. <laughs> um, he just was not what we wanted. But he was a very forceful person, as he proved throughout his life. And um, he got us into his house, and he showed us these videos with no sound. And and we we were, like, not impressed. And we were just, like, wanting to leave. And we just didn't... Um, he just We just weren't interested. That, that's, I mean, that's the most basic way to put it. And and we were, you know, okay, the search goes on. That was our attitude, you know. But he wouldn't leave us alone. He called and he called and he called. And and he said, let's jam, let's jam, you know. And he, was, he had so much drive that it was very, very hard to ignore. And I will say this about Kevin. You know, as much as me and Randy wanted to be rock stars, we really hadn't met anybody that wanted to be a rock star as much as Kevin did. And so he did have that going for him. And we finally relented and we said, okay, okay, okay. Uh, come on over. We'll try some stuff. And, and we played with him through a guitar amp. It set back, you know, and, and it sounded terrible. Um, there's stories out there where this happened in Randy's garage. It did not happen in Randy's garage because we couldn't play in his garage because we were just too loud. We had to play inside the house. And so we were inside the house and, and we were, we were trying to draw something out of this guy um, that sounded like maybe he could be a singer. And, but we still had a problem with his looks because he didn't look anything like us. And um, and he was rather opposed to the way we looked. And so, because we were more into looking like Alice Cooper, who he hated. He hated Alice Cooper. And we we're like, oh, well, I don't know. You know, that's <laughs> sort of a deal breaker right there, you that's know. <laughs> and and he's like, no, I like like Rod Stewart and I like Humble Pie and, and you know, and all this. And we're like, eh, yeah, those guys are okay, but, you know, Alice Cooper is the shit, you know. And um, so um, it continued, and we couldn't get rid of this guy. So finally we made him a deal. We said, all right, look, we'll be in a band with you. We'll form a band with you, but you have to learn how to sing because you can't. And um, it, it, we don't know how to sing either. But if you listen to us, we can make you maybe kind of get a clue. And uh, Randy, and this was before Randy became a guitar teacher. Yeah. And um, Randy was actually born to be a teacher more than he was a rock star or uh, anything else. Um, Randy, Randy was an extremely good teacher. And I teach, too. I teach all sorts of things. I've taught photography, I've taught art, I've taught music. And I learned all that from Randy. I learned how to be a teacher from Randy. But Randy was like the ultimate teacher. And you can ask any student he ever had. And, and they will tell you, oh, yeah, that guy was a teacher. 
and and teachers are very important in our world. And um, so we said, well, here's what we think you should sound like. And we'd, we'd play them a song, you know, off of some record, Deep Purple or somebody, a Humble Pie, you know, bands, some bands that he did like. And, I, and, and we'd say, you know, well, if you can sound kind of like that, you know, then maybe we can do something with what you got. And and he tried and he tried and he tried, and he he became what I would call passable. And um, and then from there, you know, it was decided, okay, let's let's form a real band. And um, and then we started auditioning drummers. And again, Kevin's drive was really the thing that made things happen. He went out. He found us a real manager, a guy that would put some money into the band, a guy that would give us a real place to rehearse where the cops wouldn't get called on you because, as any garage band knows, you know, when you're playing, unless your parents are cool enough to soundproof their garage, um, you're going to get the cops called on you a lot. Yeah. And we did. And Randy even got arrested once for playing. Um real loud in his yeah. house wow. we we were jamming and the cop showed up and said the neighbors are pressing charges and uh and you're going to jail and they hooked him up they took him to jail Jeez. he was like 15 years old <laughs> oh god did he get a record uh i think we were too young to get records for all the shit we did yeah well i mean <laughs> i would think uh like it's more of a it's a civil than it is a criminal like you know playing too loud it was a fine Right. Well, I don't, know, I don't know what the state of California laws are, so I'm just guessing here. And I tell this whole story in my book, and there were some, I don't want to go into it in the interview, no, there fine, were some fine. extenuating circumstances that led to us pissing somebody off enough to to do this to us. Uh, but they didn't, they didn't take me to jail, and there was just the two of us at his house, and we were playing really loud, and the cops came. And they, they hold Randy off in handcuffs, put him in the police car, took him to jail and and uh, for playing music. Is it because and, he um, refused to stop? Is, is it because sometimes, you know, you, you the cops usually come when you're playing loud and say, OK, please settle down now. And if you don't settle down, then they take you away. Well, like I said, we did some other shit, too. Okay, that wasn't right. too cool. It's you know, that, that, it, I mean, you know, as an adult male now, I'm like, you know, well, if some fucking kid did that shit to me, you know, I'd go over there and beat his ass with a ball <laughs> exactly. bat, you know. Exactly. But, you know, when you're a kid, you don't think like that, you know. And it's just, uh, uh, you know, we did other shit to, to sort of aggravate the situation. Yeah, I get you, I get you. And, um um, and, and, and I'm not saying at all that we, we didn't deserve this, you know, I mean, it was a good scare for us for sure. Uh, but, um, and, and we actually kind of cleaned up our, our act a little bit after that, at least with the person involved with it, the neighbor. And, uh, we didn't, we didn't fuck with them anymore the way we used to. But, um, at, at this point, anyway, In your world that's made of black